When did it go from people reading charts to people making up their own parts? Well, we always made up our own parts on records. Always, from day one. Occasionally, I took a date as a young studio musician. Somebody goes, I, you want a session at uh, whatever studio, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'll take anything, because I want to break into the scene. And, you know, we all have stories. Written, uh, um, everybody has stories. Ask anybody who had to sit next to Tommy Tedesco. Tommy would go like, I, Rit told me a great story where when he first started out, Tommy was the king. Explain Tom who Tommy Tedesco Tommy was. Tommy Tedesco is the grandfather of all studio guitar players. He had a photographic memory as well as could sight read anything. And matter of fact, he could sight read so good, Glenn <laughs> Campbell told me, he turned the chart upside down and he read it perfectly, backwards. Yeah, he was the Nothing. Grand grandfather of yeah. session and, guitar and, and, playing. And, you know, everybody knew. He played an old Monkees record, I mean, he, but he was a jazzer. Right. The difference between them is all those guys in the wrecking crew and all those they were basically jazzers or That's country right. players. And then we were the rock, the, the next guys in him, and we were mostly rock players that could do other stuff. Right. And we were the upstarts, you know. We, we, Personality-wise, they were very silent in the room and just did, We were not. We were a little bit more crazy, and it was a lot more fun. Not more fun, but it was a different kind of fun. Anyway, Tommy, he would do stuff. Like, Rit came in, sat in Guitar One, because he was like the new hotshot in town, and Tommy came in, saw him, sat down with Guitar Two, and just kind of looked at him. And, it's like, and, you know, they played the first, and Rit played it great. Tommy leans over and goes, <laughs> I'll bet you a hundred bucks you're fucking up this time. <laughs> they count off the tune, sure enough. <laughs> It's like, God. You go to Tommy, meet Tommy at the, you used to have to go to the Musicians Union to pick up your checks, which were always like months after you did the session. And it used to be the thing, who has the most pile of checks? It's just right. stupid teenage shit, even though we were young. It was a lot of fun. But Tom, if you saw Tommy at the end, you had to be careful, because he was, a, he liked to gamble a lot. So he would bet anybody anything. Now, these checks could be for record dates, they could be for jingles, which would like, you do a jingle for a half hour back then, it's 30 bucks. Well, how do you even keep track of this stuff? You have a date book. Okay. It says I'm here, and then yeah. in a certain period of time, you know you're going to be paid. If you haven't been paid, then you have to follow up with it. Oh my God. But generally, everybody was really cool and professional back okay. then, so it didn't really happen much. Uh, but <laughs> Tommy would go like, put his hand on the, on the chair, I'll bet you that, uh, I'll bet you the whole pile of checks that my check is higher than yours. Do you wanna <laughs> take the bet? Now you're looking at Tommy going, I've been doing all record dates, so I know my checks are for grand, a couple grand, and his could have been for like a movie date for, you know, whatever, or, or a jingle for 25 bucks or something. Right. And Jeff Picard lost to him a couple times, and Jeff was the busiest guy in town. like Tommy. Because <laughs> he didn't want to not play with Tommy. He's just a legend. It's like, and if you right. lose to Tommy, you go, okay, I lost to Tommy. Won't do it again. But everybody lost to Tommy at least once. And he was so great about it. He was like, he liked it. He's make you pay. There's some guys that go, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. there's certain gamblers that like when you lose, you pay. I'd like to take a second to talk to you about this channel. This is actually Rick Beato too. I've had it since the beginning of my main channel and many of you are not subscribed. As a matter of fact, 87% of the people that watch this channel regularly are not subscribed. So I would encourage you to hit the subscribe button on this channel and on my main channel. This will help me get better guests and help continue to grow both of these channels. Thank you. Talk about the guys that like, like Jay Graydon, he was Carlton. He, well, these yeah. guys. Well, the the kind of the guys that were there. I would say right that, before you, know, you when you I first were. got interested in becoming a studio musician, as I it was obviously after I met the Picaro family and their father was his top call. Steve, God bless Joe. For, you know, you know, we spent a lot of time at his house. You know rehearsing and stuff and Jeff would always pop over because we were still in high school. Jeff was the drummer in Steely Dan when we were in high school. So they were making Katie Lied wow. while we were in high school. And our high school band was me and Michael Landau on guitar, John Pierce on bass, Carlos Vega on drums, Steve Picaro on keyboards. Oh Plus we had three singers, Charlie, Laurie, and Gina. And uh, Jeff and David Page would come down and sit in with us. You know, And then we were like playing stuff off of uh, Katie Lied before the record came out. You know. We were all inspired. This is what we want to do. So we followed all the players that were on these records. Okay. Now, where I live in Los Angeles, I could go see Larry Carlton and Robin Ford play at this little jazz club called Dante's. Right. Down the street. Yeah. And because I knew Jeff was playing with them, and I knew, you know, I was able to meet these guys. And, you know, when, I, when the Royal Scam album came out, man, that was a life-changing guitar event. It's like Larry Carlton playing 
the way he plays and using the notes and the way he plays with a rock sound, you know, with the distorted guitar sound, that was the like, whoa. Yeah. That was one of those moments in my life, just like hearing Hendrix and Jeff Beck and Clapton and Page, he playing the, at the t top of their powers, hit that same, besides the Beatles, which was the first hit, you know. But that one just hit me. Because that was like, I had been going, I want to do something different than all the rest of everybody else. So I basically got sucked into that album hard. Amazing. Yeah. I remember Carlos Rios was very young at the time. He came over to my house and he knew the solo. He said, me that solo. So, you know, he's another great player, great guy. But, uh, you know, that one really hit me. And then through that, then I was listening to Jay Graydon playing on these great Gino Vanelli records. And oh, he yeah. had some great solos on the early A&M records. Not prior to him having the biggest hit that he had, but the, I used to love all those early uh, Gino records. Great changes and just oh, Jay, yeah. Jay ripped them. Jay was doing all, he was the call. So when I met Jay through Jeff Picaro and David Page, I met David Foster, who was a huge influence and help in my early career. But I met all these guys and Larry, Larry used to let me come up to the house and hang out with him. And he was pretty stern with me, man. Like he wasn't, you know. In what way? He's not, he's not a lovey-dovey guy. I mean like, <laughs> I don't know, it's not to say he's not a great guy. Larry's the nicest but, but he, guy, but, but you I know, can Laura, I'll come up and jump on you and hug you. He would never do that. Right. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just every world different that way. But yeah. he's a, an incredibly great guy. But And shared information that I will... I mean, I used to... When we did when he, we did this tour together in 1998, it was one of those Japanese oh, yeah. things. Let's put guys together. And they offered him a list of people. He said, let's, let's try to get Lukey out here and see what's going on. Just try to... And we had a blast. And every night, an hour before the show, I'd walk into the Larry's dressing room with a guitar. I go, okay, what's my lesson for the day? And and because I go, well, I got a captive audience here. Now, after studying his stuff all these years, and I had already made a name for myself, whatever it was, 1998. Larry was so gracious in sharing his knowledge. And part of that knowledge was, you know, most people think in terms of scales and linear things like that. But with Larry. What he taught me, some of the information he taught me, I could, he didn't give it to me all, I'm not smart enough to take in all the information Larry Carlton has. But he shared with me the way he thinks in terms, in terms of triads with different bass notes. Right. Like in the key of E, it's like you know, people say, let's just jam in modal E and yeah. And he goes, but if somebody's just vamping, you also have. Working all the way up the scale with or any kind of altered, you know. Right. That's still just a, a D flat. flat. Yeah, but it's, yeah. I mean, if you think, if you get out of this, a lot of people get freaked out with, oh, 13 flat nine, what do I play over that? I don't know theory. But D, Larry D said, flat triad. Well, this is what Larry opened up for me. It's like, okay, you can look at it that way, and technically that's what it is, but if you just look at it as a D flat chord with an E right. in the bass, that opens up a lot more real estate for you to go, where can I go with that? Because all we all did, all I ever did when I was young was copy the solos of the, my favorite artists and then, you know, sneak in as time goes by, all that thievery you've done that we all do. Right. If you do it long enough and, you, and you're not just, you know, Xeroxing it, playing it, it, you incorporate some of those ideas in your own playing, that's how you develop your own style. Yeah. There's only 12 notes, I mean, how many, th they've been played. Maybe every permutation of a great melody was done 10,000 years ago. And here we are just trying to make sense of it. 